only a narrow gash in the earth. And in places, the rims of the Grand Canyon are 18 miles apart. How did the canyon get so wide? Well, it's important to understand that the river by itself did not carve this canyon. The river did cut down its own channel, but basically it's a transportation system. It's the freight train that carried all the rest of the rock out. And the canyon was widened out by all of the side streams and all the little rivulets that are carving into the canyon wall. It's not the river that made the great wide canyon that we see, but all the tributary drainage systems that, that led to the carving of the canyon. Side streams and tributaries flow into the main Colorado River, gouging out their own side canyons, like this one. When there's a violent storm, truck-sized boulders tear loose from the canyon walls and are driven headlong in a terrifying wall of mud and rock called a debris flow. Seldom are human beings in a position to film debris flows. Usually they're running for their lives to high ground. This rare footage of a debris flow sweeping through a dry valley was also shot by scientists in China in 1990. Traveling 20 miles per hour, the flow packs the power of a river of liquid concrete. The changes in the canyon country do not occur by the gradual grain by grain wearing away of the countryside as so often portrayed in the geology text. But rather, the, most of the time, hardly any change is taking place at all. And then when it does occur, it occurs as a sequence of major catastrophes, local catastrophes, uh, which occur with a frequency of about once every thousand years. And that, I think, is in fact the way most geological changes happen, not just here in the canyons of the Colorado, but generally in the landscape of the Earth. Here in the canyon, such debris flows rip out of side canyons, like this one, finally emptying into the main stem of the Colorado. Just downstream of the side canyons, the gravel and boulders collect, forming a kind of rock dam that chokes off the river's flow and creates a rapid. The challenge for river runners here is that the Colorado drops 2,100 feet as it travels through the canyon, and half of that drop happens at the rapids. We rejoin the GSA group as they approach one of the canyon's more notorious rapids. Hans Rapids is also known as the Rock Garden. The boatmen will pull over to have a look. What about these down here? We get out. Well, you don't want to get that far left. Yeah, right about where he is. You want to be this, you want this to be this side, side of, of the rowboat. Right above Hans Rapid, and I want to scout this rapid for my run, and I'm looking at where the rocks are in the channel. I want to, I want to see where the tongue's at, and I'm going to be heading into what's called a duck pond. There's some real still water, and I want to get in that, and it gives me a chance to slow down and reassess my situation so I can look down river and set up for the, for the run down below. It's one of the steepest drops along the Colorado River system. And at this stage, it's low water. There's a lot, a lot of rocks in the channel. And it's, uh, I have a lot of respect for this rapid. Okay, he's doing the motor run and uh, he might not have enough power to get back to the left. And it he's could be going. pretty interesting hitting these holes. He's just, he's gonna, see that yeah. rock sticking up right there? Right. There's a big hole just left of it that he's gonna go over. Right, right there. there, there he goes. Okay, he's setting himself up for the big hole down below. He might flip it right there. there is. Oh, keep he's in there. He's surfing up. Oh, oh. He's swamped, but he's out. Oh, he popped it out. I he don't did. believe it. That was he close. popped it out. He almost lost he it. He did. He was All surfing right. in there. Woo! That gets my blood stirred. Let's Mine get too. out of here. Yeah, let's go. Let's run it. Ah! Yo! This is boatman John Stoner's 130th trip down Colorado. 
and some of us are glad. Next morning, rounding the bend at mile 31, we come to Stanton's Cave, first described in 1889 by explorer Robert Stanton. Here, archaeologists have collected the oldest human artifacts yet discovered in the Grand Canyon. Small animal figures fashioned out of willow twigs 4,000 years ago by people known as the desert culture. It's thought these figures may have been used during religious ceremonies to pray for a good hunt. Later inhabitants of the canyon were the legendary Anasazi people, ancestors of modern Pueblo peoples like the Hopi. Here in the fertile Nancoweep Delta, Anasazi farmers grew squash and maize, storing their harvests high in a cliffside granary, safe from rodents and thieves. Spanish conquistadors were the first Europeans to arrive at the rim of the Grand Canyon in 1540. They gazed across the terrifying abyss and saw what appeared to be only a small stream. The party could find no way to make the steep descent to the canyon floor and turned back. Then in 1857, an attempt was made to sail a steamboat up the Colorado River from the south. After two months, Lieutenant Joseph Christmas Ives gave up. Comparing the canyon to the gate of hell, he wrote, after entering it, there is nothing to do but leave. Ours has been the first and will doubtless be the last party of whites to visit this profitless locality. It seems intended by nature that the Colorado River shall be forever unvisited and undisturbed. Thirty-three miles downstream of Lee's Ferry, we come to Red Wall Cavern, named by John Wesley Powell and his men when they camped here. It's a vast limestone chamber carved by the river as it flowed around the bend, and its ceiling is over 100 feet high. For river runners today, Red Wall Cavern is a favorite afternoon stop. Later in the day, we make an early camp. And tonight, the tales around the Kansas Geological Survey's campfire are told by the great grandnephew of John Wesley Powell himself, Donald Powell Shinaki. The unique thing about John Wesley Powell was that he was never, never satisfied when he would land at a place like this in the afternoon. He's always curious on what was upstairs, and so he'd he'd skinny up the rocks and go to the top and, and look around. And many times he would stay up there and come down after dark. And if you can imagine coming down one of these cliffs in the dark with one arm, uh, that was a feat in itself. Standing on my toes, my muscles begin to tremble. 
It is 60 or 80 feet to the foot of the precipice. I find I can get up no farther and cannot step back for I dare not let go with my hand. I call to Bradley for help. At this instant, it occurs to Bradley to take off his drawers and swing them down to me. I seize the dangling legs and with his assistance, gain the top. It's a tricky climb up to Nautiloid Canyon, but for those who make the effort, a ghostly marine treasure awaits. We're now sitting on the floor of Nautiloid Canyon, which is in the Red Wall Limestone, making the great walls of the canyon around us. The Red Wall Limestone is a marine deposit formed in a shallow sea uh, many millions of years ago, and we know that because right here is one of those marine shells. I'm going to pour some water on it so that it shows better. This is the outline of a nautiloid shell. It had a long stovepipe sort of cylindrical shell with curved partitions across it. And it's related to the modern chambered nautilus, which currently lives in the Indian Ocean. Except these had straight shells and the chambered nautilus has coiled shells. Meet the nautiloid's modern descendant. 300 million years ago, a vast shallow sea like this one covered not only the Grand Canyon region, but much of what is Western North America today. It's hard to imagine all of the things that have gone on in this place, but the Grand Canyon record tells us of mountain ranges, uh, seas that have advanced and retreated at least 18 times across Arizona, a variety of the coastal swamp conditions, desert dunes, and all of these marvelous things have happened in this place over a period of two billion years, and they're recorded in the Grand Canyon record. We head on downstream for lunch with members of the Kansas expedition. They're fishing for rainbow trout, a species that was introduced here in 1964. That fish has been in the river a long time. See how pink the meat is? Did you catch it? Uh, I'm not sure. Frank probably caught it. Hey. I'm up to the <laughs> Great job, kid. Where's Keep marshmallow coming. Marshmallow and a piece of shrimp. <laughs> hey, how about that? Nice going. Where do you want him? In the bucket? Right over here. No, over here on the ground. What? Right over here on the ground. That's, That's a two I've caught about that big. The second one was that big, too. OK, here he goes, poor little guy. There you go, kid. Stay with him. A former governor of Kansas, Mike Hayden, is among old friends on this trip. A year ago, he became assistant secretary of the U.S. Department of the Interior, which oversees the Grand Canyon National Park. Our national park system is designed with long-range goals of protection, uh, conservation of the environment and of the ecosystems for all time not only for this generation, but for future generations. Uh, we are trying to make sure that these ecosystems are healthy uh, for our grandchildren's children as well. There's been a big change since the days of John Wesley Powell, when man was at the mercy of nature in the canyon. Today, the major force of change here is man himself. For the past century has brought intensive development of the Colorado River for irrigation and hydroelectric power. There's a classic struggle going on here between conservation and development. A story that began back in the early years of the century. During the first two decades, the wild Colorado River periodically flooded towns and farmland throughout the river's lower basin, devastating places like California's fertile Imperial Valley. What was needed, the government decided, were dams for flood control and irrigation. Dams that would convert the Colorado from a natural menace to a national resource. 
And so in 1923, Colonel Claude Birdseye and his men were dispatched from the US Geological Survey to look for possible dam sites. On the 1st of August, the Birdseye expedition set out from Lee's Ferry, determined to tame the Colorado River and have a good time doing it. The legacy of the bird's eye expedition now dominates life in the Grand Canyon. Glen Canyon Dam, built in 1964, just 15 miles above Lee's Ferry, is one of 15 dams now controlling the Colorado River system. The dam has flooded what used to be Glen Canyon, storing the Colorado's waters in a massive man-made lake stretching 280 miles to the north. The lake is named after the region's premier explorer, Lake Powell. The Glen Canyon Dam is run by the Federal Bureau of Reclamation and until recently has been a steady producer of premium peak hydroelectric power, available instantly during periods of high demand to the states of the Southwest. Downstream, the dam has dramatically altered the Colorado River and the Grand Canyon's ecosystem in ways that scientists are still struggling to understand. One of the concerns we have now is that things are changing within the Grand Canyon along the river. The wildlife is changing, the plant life is changing, the beaches are changing, the fish populations are changing. Some of this may be good as we look at it, and some of it may be uh, objectionable or harmful. We don't really know all of that, but clearly things are changing because of what we have done upstream. Certain changes are quite apparent, such as the erosion of beaches. Since the river's flow is now regulated, there are no springtime floods to bring in fresh sand to replenish the beaches. In addition, the dam's peak power production requires sudden release of huge volumes of water stored in Lake Powell. This creates sudden fluctuations in the river's flow, which tear away at the canyon's beaches. The river has been known to rise by 13 feet in 24 hours. Stanley Buse leads a research team that's been tracking the beach erosion since 1980. Their work is part of a major Grand Canyon environmental impact study. What we hope to do with this study is provide sufficient data so that the Bureau of Reclamation can manage the flow of water through Grand Canyon in such a way as to both provide power generation as needed and still protect the beaches from being eroded away. As this historical footage shows, the wild pre-dam Colorado, whose name means red in Spanish, carried a heavy load of sediment as it coursed through canyons. Now its powerful surge is stopped at Glen Canyon Dam and the sediment settles out, dropping to the bottom of Lake Powell. So the Colorado River of today is clear and green. It's also far colder, 45 degrees year round, because the water released into the canyon comes from deep in Lake Powell. While trout flourish in the colder temperatures, the canyon's native fish are in trouble. Two species have been wiped out, and others, like this unusual humpback chub, are endangered. Deer have always been seen near the river, but it's unknown how they're being affected by another major change here, a dramatic increase in vegetation. Now that the dam stops the floods that used to tear away young plant life, 
this new, larger corridor of greenery has taken hold. The new growth supports more insects, more reptiles, and more bird life. But what the dam has created, it may one day take away. Plants are rooted in sand, and if the beaches continue to be eroded, this new vegetation may disappear with them. The environmental impact study will ultimately take into account the conclusions of 94 scientific research projects, tracking all the changes in the canyon, great and small. In November 1991, the Secretary of the Interior made an interim decision to reduce peak flows of water at the dam by 70%. A final decision is expected in 1994. Back on the river at mile 77, we enter a dramatic passageway into the deepest part of the canyon. Here we encounter the twisted and melted forms of the canyon's oldest rocks, the 1.7 billion year old Vishnu Schist. Okay, and here we're at the beginning of the inner gorge, which is composed of these dark and rather sinister looking rocks called the Vishnu Schist. These rocks once were um, sandstone and shale, which have been cooked with great heat and pressure at uh, the base of what was probably a very high mountain range once upon the time. And they're very hard as a result, and Powell knew this very well. And uh, he was worried that perhaps there may be some pretty uh, hairy river running ahead of him because of that. The Vishnu Schist is all that remains of mountains that once rose as high as the Himalayas. Over the course of 800 million years, through the grinding power of erosion, these mountains were worn down to their ancient roots which have been melted by the Earth's internal heat. Because of the extreme hardness of these rocks, the river flowing through them is tightly constrained with rough rapids. The gorge is black and narrow below, red and gray and flaring above with crags on the walls. Down in these grand, gloomy depths we glide, ever listening for the mad waters keep up their roar. The boats are entirely unmanageable. The next morning at mile 157, the GSA group discovers another of the canyon's magical places, Havasu Canyon and the turquoise waters of Havasu Creek. At the falls, we join a group of young hikers already plunging in. Twenty miles farther on, we enter a dramatic landscape created by the most recent cataclysmic events in the canyon. Here stands Vulcan's Anvil, a huge block of lava which was cast out of the throat of an erupting volcano a million years ago. It stands as herald to the vast flows of lava which once cascaded over the canyon walls downstream. What a conflict of water and fire there must have been here. Just imagine a river of molten rock running down into a river of melted snow. What a seething and boiling of the waters. What clouds of steam rolled into the heavens. 
Now we can see the alignment of the volcanoes right on the fault. No volcanoes are currently active, but the best place to see the ancient flows is from the air above Prospect Valley. Little volcano here sitting on the fault. Beautiful structural control of the eruptions. The only way to get to Prospect Valley Overlook is by helicopter. The mountains in the distance are all dormant volcanoes. And nearby, the cinder cone of the canyon's own volcano. We're standing here on the south rim of the canyon, just opposite one of the young volcanoes, which you can see behind me, which is called Vulcan's Throne. Lavas have spilled down over the rim of the uh, canyon and all the way down into the canyon floor. These are the youngest rocks uh, that have been formed now in, in the region of the Grand Canyon. And the succession of flows that has come out has dammed the river over a period of time. In fact, a whole series of dams were built and then cut away by the river, the highest lava dams rising more than 1,000 feet above the river floor, backing the water up all the way almost to Lee's Ferry at one point. River gravels plastered high on the canyon walls show that in the past million years, lava flows blocked the river at least 13 times, flooding the canyon and creating enormous lakes. But each time, the river would eventually carve its way through. Well, the history of the river sweeping away each successive lava dam bears a lesson for us, of course, with regard to the dams made by man, uh, because surely that will happen also in the dams that we've built on the river that we think are, are so permanent, so massive, such as Glen Canyon Dam. Uh, that will also be swept away. And it will be gone in a twinkling geologically, and it will be taken away just as surely as the great dams downstream. Just below Vulcan's throne roars Lava Falls, by far the largest and most feared rapids in the canyon, a dramatic drop of 37 feet. It's famous for an especially nasty hole created by a collection of underwater boulders. Well, Lava Falls is my nemesis on the river. That's the one spot where I, I uh, actually had a problem with the boat uh, dropped it into a hole at the head of the rapid. Uh, didn't look like the boat was going to come out, so I be, decided it'd be time to get out of the boat and went through Lava Falls on my life jacket. Of course, the boat popped right out of the hole as soon as I abandoned it, and it came through right side up. But meantime, I spent most of my time underwater. It's not a way I, uh, that I recommend going through Lava Falls for anyone else. Now it's our turn. It only takes 13 seconds. So why does it feel like a lifetime? Watch that tight corner. <laughs> By the time John Wesley Powell and his men reached this part of the river, their rations were down to coffee and beans. Half the men had no shoes, and there were not enough blankets to go around. Even George Bradley, who had saved Powell's life, was losing patience with the Major as his diary records. I've been working like galley slaves. The Major, as usual, has chosen the worst camping ground possible. If I had a dog that would lie where my bed is made tonight, I would kill him and swear I never owned him. 
Impossible to keep anything dry. The single major tra tragic episode of Powell's first trip occurred as a result of the separation of three men in his party, men who decided that they had had enough in the rigors of trying to push down the lower part of the Grand Canyon. They finally came to a great rapid, uh, which just discouraged them completely. And three of the men, the, the Holland brothers and William Dunn, decided they'd rather risk their lives hiking out of the canyon and back to the Mormon settlements on the North Rim than to try to run the rapid. Uh, Powell did his best to persuade these men to go with him and not to climb out, but he was unsuccessful. For me, there is no sleep. All night long, I pace up and down, and at one time, I almost conclude to leave the river. But to say that there is a part of the canyon which I cannot explore, having nearly accomplished it, is more than I am willing to acknowledge. I determine to go on. The next day, the three men held to their decision and left the expedition here at what is now called Separation Canyon. At the end of their long climb to the rim, they were mistaken for prospectors who had molested an Indian woman and were killed on the spot by tribesmen. Unaware of their companion's fate, Powell and his remaining men continued on their journey. Two days later, the great walls leveled out and they emerged safely from the Grand Canyon. The relief from danger and the joy of success are great. The river rolls by us in silent majesty. Our joy is almost ecstasy. We sit till long after midnight, talking of the Grand Canyon, talking of home. When Powell returned from the canyon, he became a national hero. He went on to survey the entire Southwest and later became director of the U.S. Geological Survey. He fought to slow the rapid unplanned settlement of the West, predicting today's bitter battles over the region's limited supplies of water. It has been said that John Wesley Powell understood the West better than anyone. The glories and the beauties of form, color, and sound unite in the Grand Canyon. It has infinite variety. You cannot see the Grand Canyon in one view. You have to toil from month to month through its labyrinths. If strength and courage are sufficient for the task, a concept of sublimity can be obtained never again to be equaled on the hither side of paradise. We're almost through our journey now. We head on into camp. Our bones a little weary, our clothes a little damp. Our spirits, though, are soaring, for while we're in this place, no one can try to take from us the smile that's on our face. Yes. Enjoy additional broadcasts of NOVA Sunday evenings at 7 and Wednesday afternoons at 4.
Okay, folks, get ready for this. Smile. Are we ready? All right, ready? Ready. No. That's it.